Very good afternoon to our distinguished guests, our patrons, our professors, our colleagues. I would like to talk about the optimization and management of chronic heart failure. I will speak in English most of the time, but let me allow to speak a little bit in Myanmar language for the points I would like to stress, because uh, the lectures might be very boring after the very delicious lunch offered by CFM. I have nothing to declare. Here is the outline of my presentation. Firstly, the introduction and followed by how to diagnose heart failure and optimization of guideline directed medical therapy GDMT with the clinical evidences for the heart failure with reduced EF, half ref, and heart failure with preserved EF. That's what we call the half pef and followed by the indication of the cardiac implantable electronic devices, CIEDs, in the half ref followed by the holistic care. Heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome with the symptoms and signs that result from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of the blood. The true prevalence of heart failure in Asia-Pacific region is suggested to range from 1.3% to 6.7%. And this translates to an average of four cases of heart failure for every 100 people in the region. And registry and the epidemiological data indicate that the heart failure patients in the Asia-Pacific regions are younger compared to the European countries, and they have more severe signs and symptoms compared with their counterparts in the Western countries. And in the Asia-Pacific region, because of the poverty, heart failure becomes a major public health problem because of the high prevalence, huge socioeconomic burden, and poor outcome. This is the combined survival rate for people with the heart failure over time. This data from the systematic review and meta-analysis of the survival of patients with heart failure in the community shows that despite the improvement in the five-year survival rates between 1970 and 1979 and 2000 to 2009, with the development of the new treatments and the device therapy, Mortality rates remain unacceptably high and larger than most of the types of the cancers in the region. I would like to mention a little bit about the ACC AHA heart failure stages and the NYHA class. ACC AHA stage A is classified as an individual at risk of developing heart failure with no clinical signs of the heart failure. And the treatment recommendation for the stage A include the management of the comorbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerotic diseases, obesity, and metabolic syndrome, according to the guidelines. And for the stage B, it is classified as the individual with the asymptomatic structural heart diseases like left ventricular hypertrophy, pharmacological treatment, blood pressure control, statin for the lipid management in combination with the lifestyle changes are mandatory. And the stage C is symptomatic and stage D is the refractory heart failure requiring advanced intervention. For the NYHA classes, class 1 is asymptomatic, class 2 is symptomatic with moderate exertion, 3 is symptomatic with minimal exertion, and 4 is symptomatic at rest. Mimalo nale ang pyo yin so yin no, yoga le khana ma pya di, nene mo la vi, toto li ro mo la vi, na ni ra rao amo ma pye ro u po no. Most of the guidelines refer to the NYHA classes in the clinical trials. That's why I mentioned the NYHA classes beforehand. This is the diagnostic algorithm of the heart failure. When we suspect the heart failure, we should look for the risk factor of heart failure where the patient is having the hypertension, comorbid conditions, or the myocardial ischemia, where the patients have symptoms and signs, classical symptoms and signs like dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, beta edema, etc., and followed by the measurement of the anti bro BMP and the BMP. Anti bro BMP cutoff point is more than or equal to 125 picogram per mil, and BNP cutoff point is more than 35 picogram per mil, and anti bro BMP is preferred over BNP. And later followed by the echocardiographic assessment where we find the abnormal findings and the heart failure is confirmed after measurement of the left ventricular ejection fraction. When the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than or equal to 40%, this is heart failure with reduced LVEF, half ref. If the 
LVEF is between 41 and 49 percent. This is heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And the EF is more than or equal to 50 percent. This is assigned as the heart failure with preserved LVEF, half pef And later on, we determined the etiology and commenced the treatment for the heart failure. Most of the guidelines that we follow are the guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology and ACC AHA guidelines, which are supposed for the patients with the uh, heart failure in the European regions and United States of America. So the Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region, Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology has made the consensus statement in the diagnosis and management of chronic heart failure patient. The consensus is made by the uh, eminent uh, cardiologists and heart failure specialists in the Asia Pacific region. The guidelines is not very much different. For the diagnosis, patients with the signs and symptoms, we measure the anti bro BMP and BMP. For the Asia Pacific region, the only thing they skip is that if we cannot perform the anti bro BMP and BMP because of the financial reasons, we can skip directly to the echocardiography to measure the LVEF and the cutoff points are also the same. And after the confirmation of the heart failure, we need to make the assessments like the renal function, liver function, thyroid function, and assessment of the anemia if present. And we should initiate the heart failure pharmacotherapy directly, and we should identify the etiology and treat the etiology as well. Here are the few pictures of the chest X-ray showing the gross cardiomegaly, echo in the end mode showing the enlarged left ventricular with the left ventricular diameter enlargement, and this is the echocardiogram showing the enlarged left ventricle with the functional MR. I have already mentioned the uh, classification of the heart failure according to the LVEF, but in the case of the heart failure with the mid-range LVEF, uh, with the advanced medications, the heart failure with the mid-range LVEF, they can have the improved LVEF to heart failure with ejection fraction more than or equal to 50%. Uh, there is limited evidence to guide to the treatment for this patient who improved their LVEF from mildly reduced to more than equal to 50%. It is unclear whether to treat these patients as the half pef or the heart failure with the mildly reduced EF. So this slide is included because in patients with the heart failure with reduced LVEF, with the treatment, their LVEF can be improved a little bit into the mid-range. So low the bar or heart failure with EF less than 40%, or proper treatment baby or follow-up low light day EF can be improved in mid-range day or mid-range classification or So I would like to mention about the heart failure with the reduced LV ejection fraction how to manage. This is the therapeutic algorithm. In the management, we have the pillars of the treatment, like ACEI or ANI, beta blocker, mineral glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, and SGLT2 inhibitors like dabaglifosin and baglifosin. And for the patient with fluid retention, the loop diuretics, these are the class one indication. If the patient still have LVEF less than or equal to 35% and narrow QRS, if the patient condition is appropriate, we can consider for the ICD, implantable cardiovascular defibrillator therapy. And if the LVEF is more than 35% or device therapy is not indicated or inappropriate, if the symptoms persist, we can continue therapy with the class 2 indication. If the patient is in sinus rhythm, but LVEF is still less than 35% with the medical therapy with the YQRS complex, Cardiac resynchronization therapy with either defibrillator or pacing mode is indicated. These are the summary. This is from the 2021 ESC guideline. There are some updates in the 2023 ESC guidelines and I will mention later. This is the proposed algorithm of the pharmacotherapy of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as endorsed by the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology consensus statement. All the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they should have the, they must have the ANI, ACEI, or ARB, beta blocker, mineral glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And these treatments should initiate as soon as possible and titrate every two to three weeks over three to six months period. 
for the optimized dosing. Assess the patient for the additional pharmacotherapy in case of the sinus rhythm, but heart rate is still more than 70. We have given enough of the beta blocker. Patient cannot tolerate beta blocker anymore, and then we can get the ivabradine. And if the patient is anemic, we can consider for the IV ferric carboxymaltose. And there is a role for the variciguat in the recent worsening heart failure, but I will tell you later, the evidence is not so strong. And the joxin for the symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy and nitrates and hydralazine if the patient cannot tolerate ARNI, ACEI or ARB. And during these treatments, diuretics should be continued for the congestion if there is any and treating the comorbidity is important. Uh, I would like to mention something about the side of action of the drugs that, that I mentioned before in the treatment of the heart failure. The heart failure is the complex interplay of the renin angiotensin aerostone system and the uh, sympathetic nervous system and atria natriuretic peptide. So we need to block all these interplays. So firstly, the ACE inhibitors, they inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme. Therefore, finally, they inhibit the synthesis of the angiotensin II. Angiotensin receptor blockers block the binding of angiotensin II to its receptor so that the end results cannot be achieved. And the beta blockers inhibit the sympathetic activity and the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists tackled on the aerostone to prevent the solar water retention and finally the diuretics for the decongestion. Here are the famous four pillars of the heart failure for the contemporary pharmacological therapy of heart failure with reduced EF recently endorsed. These are the four pillars. Ani, beta blocker, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, SGLD2 inhibitors. Initiate at the same time, and we should optimize the dosing, and finally reassessment whether the patient can tolerate or responding. For the ani, there can be dose up titration, beta blocker as well. Mineralocorticoid has the two step dose up titration from 25 mg OD to 50 mg OD. For the SGLT2 inhibitors, the dosing is empaglifosin 10 mg OD or dapaglifosin 10 mg OD in the clinical trials. So these are the four pillars. And points to note about is that the patient cannot tolerate ARNIs or ACEI. ARB can be used instead. Sometimes the, with the ACEI, the patient a complaint of intractable cough, and we can switch to ARB. But only the few ARBs like candesertin, losartan, and valsartan are supported by the RCTs, and there are no ARBs yet to show the reduced all-cause mortality. So the minimally tolerated dose might be a little bit lower in the Asian population because of the low body size. Because of the difference in body size, the Asians uh, may tolerate a little bit lower dose compared to the large body sizes of the European people. And up titration of the individual medication should not be done at the expense of addition of one of the other four foundational medications. Oh, the up titrate patient up dosing, up This is the evidence-based dosing for a few drugs mentioned in the guideline. For the Ramipro, for example, 5 mg BD is the target dose. We are using a lot of beta blockers like bisoprolol, carvedilol, metoprolol extended release or the control release medication. Dosing are here. For the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, we can use the spironolactone. If the patient complains of very painful gynecomasia, we can switch to eplerinone. The dosing is 50 mg OD for both. And for the SGLT2 inhibitor, the dosing is 10 mg OD for both empaglifosin and tapaglifosin. So when do we start these medications to the patients? After they present with the acute heart failure, the goal of the first titration visit is within 48 hours before discharge to reach at least half of the doses of recommended medication. 
Titration of the four target doses for oral therapies should be attempted within two weeks after discharge with appropriate safety and monitoring, of course, and high-intensity care for initiation and rapid titration of oral heart failure therapies and close follow-up in the first six weeks after discharge for acute heart failure hospitalization is recommended to reduce the heart failure hospitalization and all-cause death. This is uh, strongly pointed in the strong heart failure trial. So we should th initiate the therapy within 48 hours, slowly up titrate within two weeks, and then later we should follow up patients in six weeks time after discharge for the optimization of medical therapy and looking for the side effect of the drugs that we prescribe. So what about the evidences of these medications that I have mentioned earlier? So this is the positive trials in the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction from 1986 to 2020. With the development of the uh, scaputral valve sudden in the 2014, approved by the Paradigm Heart Failure Clinical Trial, there has been the paradigm shift in the heart failure management. And later on, heart failure management studies include the SGLT2s inhibitors. So these are the trial evidence of mortality benefit of drugs in the heart failure for the inner labril in the soft trial and the consensus trial, candesartan in the CHAM trial, beta blockers in the merit HF, CIBIS2 and Copernicus trial, and the aerostone blockers in the RAS and the emphasis heart failure trial. I would like to mention a little bit about the paradigm heart failure clinical trial because it made the paradigm shift in the management of heart failure in patients with reduced LVEF. This is the uh, clinical trial between the angiotensin receptor, nebrilicin inhibitor, that what we call the ARNI, versus the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, inalabril in heart failure. Because of at the time of that clinical trial, inalabril has the best evidence of improving survival in patients with the chronic heart failure. That's why ARNI is compared to inalabril in the paradigm heart failure study. This is the mechanism of action of the ARNI. ARNI is the combination of two components containing the valsartan. Valsartan acts on the angiotensin receptor and nebrilicin inhibitor blocks the nebrilicin. So nebrilicin, it is an neutral endopeptides, and it degrades several endogenous vasoactive peptides, including the natriuretic peptide, bradykinin, and adrenomodulin. And inhibition of the nebrilicin increases the level of these substances so that counteracting the neurohormonal overactivation that contributes to vasoconstriction, sodium retention, and maladaptive remodeling, so that the nebrilicin inhibitor can reverse all these actions by inhibiting the nebrilicin, which breaks down the endopeptidases. So the nebrilicin inhibition potentiates the action of the endogenous vasoactive peptides that counteract the maladaptive mechanism in heart failure, finally leading to the reduction in the neurohormonal activation, reduction in the vascular toll, reduction in the cardiac fibrosis and hypertrophy, and reduction in the sodium retention. These benefits are all beneficial in patients with chronic heart failure. So what are the key results of the paradigm heart failure? There is 20% reduction in the primary endpoint of CV death and heart failure hospitalization. 20% reduction in the CV death, 21% reduction in the heart failure hospitalization, and 16% reduction in the all-cause mortality. So the drug is good. Next drug is the famous SGLT2 inhibitor. The previous speaker has mentioned all about the SGLT receptors and the most of the mechanism of action. SGLT2 inhibitors block the SGLT2 in the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidney so that the glucose is not absorbed and then there will be glycosuria. With the glycosuria, water will follow, so there will be natriuresis and the diuresis as well. So the SGLT2 inhibitors have the multidimensional cardiovascular effects and benefits in the heart failure. Because of the diuretic action, it can decrease the sodium and decrease the plasma volume and the blood pressure, thereby decreasing the afterload. 
and decrease the circulating vo volume, this reduces the preload, so that the both preload and afterload are reduced by the drug, and its inhibition promotes the diuresis, and it causes smooth muscle relaxation, and it also has the protective action on the cardiac myocytes. And what about the broad cardiorenal effects? It increases the renal erythropoietin and oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, and constant glycosuria by itself has the direct cardiac benefit by the shifting the metabolism in favor of oxidation of free fatty acid, which in turn optimize the mitochondria function in cardiac myocytes, so improve the contractile function of the heart. And it also reduces the epicardial fat by decreasing the noxious inflammation and fibrosis associated with the heart failure. And these mechanisms may explain the reduction in the LV mass index by SGLT2 inhibitors. And other cardiovascular benefits include it inhibits the fibroblast activation, reduce sympathetic overdrive, reduce atherosclerosis, and decrease the renal production of the inflammatory cytokines by the amper glyphosin. So this is the proposed myocardial mechanism of the glyphosin that I have mentioned earlier. So what about the evidence? Is that good? Is that safe? So I would like to mention a little bit about the Emperor Reduce, the Emperor Glyphosin in the heart failure with the reduced LVEF. In this study, the inclusion criteria is patients with NYHA class 2 to 4 with reduced LVEF of less than or equal to 40 with elevated anti-bro PMP and patients have been receiving the guideline-directed medical therapy for more than or equal to one week prior to the first visit and EGFR of more than or 20. And the primary endpoint is the composite of the cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Secondary endpoint is total first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization. And secondary endpoint is slope of decline of glomerular filtration rate over time. So in the Emperor Reduce study, there is 25% reduction in the combined risk of primary outcomes of CB death and hospitalization for heart failure, regardless of the type 2 diabetes mellitus. And there has also been the slope of decline in glomerular filtration rate is reduced in this Emperor Reduce study. Unlike the Emperor Reduce outcome trial, there was no significant decrease in all-cause mortality noted in the Emperor Reduce study. What about the adverse effect? There is less adverse effect related to the cardiac disorder and less adverse effect related to the worsening of the renal function. Uh, whenever we use a new medication, we should be aware of the adverse reaction. So that here are the adverse reaction of the SGLT2 inhibitors. The most frequent is the genital mycotic infection and vulvovaginal candidiasis is four or five times more common in the woman. And the serious urinary tract infections such as pyelonephritis and urosepsis and necrotizing fasciitis of the perineum are also reported. Risk of intravascular volume contraction and hypotension is especially beware of in the older adults and patients with other diuretic medication. And with the glyphosin, there have been reports of increasing risk of lower limb amputations. And SGLT2 inhibitors are contraindicated in type 1 diabetes because they promote ketone production and they may increase the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what about the another SGLT2 inhibitor, dabaglyphosin, in heart failure with reduced EF? So among the patients with heart failure and reduced EF, the risk of worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular cause was lower among those who received dabaglyphosin than among those who received placebo, regardless of the presence and absence of diabetes mellitus. Here I would like to mention a little bit about the noble age and the do the new drug that uh, most of our neighboring countries are using for our patients with the reduced LVEF. Uh, patients are patients who are patients uh, it is oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. It directly binds and stimulates the soluble guanylate cyclase and increases the cyclic GMP production. So cyclic GMP has several potentially beneficial effects in patients with heart failure, including the vasodilatation, improvement in endothelial function, and decrease in fibrosis and remodeling of the heart. But in the Victoria trial, 
Relative risk reduction is only 10% in the primary outcome of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And this 10% is much lower than that we have expected. So the, in the guideline, the use of the Verisi guard has the uh, level, level of evidence to be in the guideline. So I would like to summarize the strategic phenotypic overview of management with heart failure with reduced LVEF. Daguna Biodware O Seji Leba Babe, ACI ARB beta blocker, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and SGLD2 inhibitors. These all drugs can reduce the mortality for all patients. For reduction of the hospitalization or reduction of the mortality for the selected patients, if the patient is still volume overloaded, we should continue diuretics. For the patients with the sinus rhythm and the YQRS complex, we can consider the CRTD or CRTP. For the patients with the heart failure with ischemic therapy, ICD is recommended for the primary prevention for those without the occurrence of VT. And for the atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation must be added. And for the structural heart diseases like the aortic stenosis, surgical aortic valve replacement or transcatheter aortic valve implantation is indicated. And if the patient is not tolerated to ACI or ARB, we can use ACI or ARNI, we can use the ARB instead. And for the selective advanced heart failure patient, the options for the heart failure therapy are the mechanical circulatory devices like left ventricular assist device and finally heart transplantation. And to reduce the heart failure hospitalization and to improve the quality of life for all patients, we shouldn't neglect exercise rehabilitation and multi professional disease management. These are the holistic approach for the management of patients with heart failure with reduced LVEF. If the patient is still having very uh, low LVEF, less than or equal to 35% after three months of achieving optimal medical therapy with all the up titration of the doses, if the still, patient is still having very low LVEF, they should be referred for the cardiac implantable electronic device therapy. So this is the indication for the cardiac resynchronization therapy implantation. With the patient with the QRS duration of more than or equal to 150 milliseconds, with the left bender branch block QRS morphology and LVEF less than 35%, they have the class 1A indication for receiving CRTD. So after initially managed by the general physicians and the cardiologists, there, there can be a time when the patient should be referred to the uh, updated and complicated cardiology referral. So these advanced intervention for the heart failure, including the LVET, left ventricular assist device, and heart transplantation. So if the patient is having the advanced heart failure, NOIH is class three or four, and EF of less than 25%, they should be referred to the cardiologist at an advanced heart failure center. So these are the indications. Patients with heart failure who exhibit early organ dysfunction, patients with persistent hypotension with the systolic blood pressure of less than or 90 to 100, patient is having maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy but not improving, and at least one hospitalization for heart failure within the past 12 months, continuing edema despite increased diuretic use, and history of ventricular arrhythmia resulting in hemodynamic instability. These are the factors when we should consider for referral to the cardiologist at the advanced cardiac centers. I would like to mention a little bit about the left ventricular assist device. These are the mechanical circulatory devices. Initially, it is invented for the bridge to cardiac transplantation. Cardiac transplantation, malochema, mechanical circulatory device, they akuni ane ne Bridge to candidacy while waiting for the transplantation. Bridge to transplantation. And Cholunari Marole respond look like a long term mechanical circulatory device as the destination therapy. Destination therapy do assist device never need all me bono. This is the overall of the management of heart failure with reduced LVEF. And I would like to mention a little bit about the HFPEF. This is the uh, new topic for us. Uh, I would like to mention about the HFPEF diagnostic scoring system, which includes the 
body weight, and whether the patient is antihypertensive, atrial fibrillation, whether the patient is having pulmonary hypertension, elderly patient, or the LV filling pressure by Doppler echo. From these points, if the patient has more than or equal to six points, this is highly diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Here, I would like to highlight that the heart failure with preserved EF is not synonymous with the diastolic dysfunction. In the echocardiogram reports that we usually make, we would like to mention the diastolic function as grade one, grade two, or impaired relaxation, pseudo-normalization, restrictive LV filling, etc. But this is not synonymous with the HFPEF. So we have HFPEF scoring system for the probability of uh, diagnosing patient as having the heart failure with preserved LVEF. For the scoring system, patients should have the signs and symptoms of heart failure. LVEF is more than 50%, and there should be the objective evidence of cardiac structural or functional abnormalities, consistent with the presence of LV diastolic dysfunction or raised filling pressures and natriuretic peptides. These are the parameters that we look for. Most of the parameters are acquired by the echocardiographic investigation and anti-proBMP anti can be measured at the labs. So what about the mesh, uh, management of the heart failure with the mid-range LVEF? So in the patients with the heart failure with mildly, mildly reduced LVEF, diuretics should be prescribed for the fluid retention Embaglipsosin and dabaglipsosin has the class 1 indication. And ACEI, ARNI, MRA, and the beta blockers, they have the class 2B indication. So SGLT2 inhibitors, the dabaglipsosin or embaglipsosin is recommended in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced LVEF to reduce the risk of heart failure, hospitalization, or cardiovascular death, and it is mentioned as the class 1 indication in the 2023 focus update of 2021 ESC guideline for the management of chronic heart failure. What about the management of the HFPEF, diuretics for the fluid retention, dabaglipsosin, empaglipsosin, and the treatment of etiology, cardiovascular and the non-vascular comorbidity is equally important as the medication, also the class 1 indication, and also in the HFPEF, the glyphosin also have the class 1A indication. So this HFPEF management algorithm is adopted from the 2023 ACC Expert Consensus Opinion Pathway on the management of heart failure with preserved LVEF. For the patients with the HFPEF, we start with the SGLT2 inhibitor. If the patient is still having fluid retention, should add the loop diuretics. For the patients with the LVEF of less than or equal to 55 to 60 with those with mild fluid retention should add the mineral glucocorticoid receptor antagonist and ARNI and ARB as well. The most important in the management of the HFPEF is the treatment of the HFPEF comorbidities like atrial fibrillation, hypertension, coexisting coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, sleep apnea, and obesity. So in patients with the HFPEF, management is focus on the improved quality of life, prevention of hospitalization, and identification and treatment of all these comorbidities. So what is the clinical evidence in the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? In the Emperor Preserve study, included the patient with NYHA class more than or equal to two with the LVEF of more than 40% with the empaglipsosin 10 milligram or the matching placebo. The outcomes, the primary outcome of death from the cardiovascular disease or hospitalization of the heart failure, secondary outcomes are also fulfilled. So in the Emperor Preserve study, Emperor Glyphosin reduced the risk of primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. The key secondary outcome of total hospitalization for heart failure and EGFR slope in patients with or without CKD. So the benefit across the primary and key secondary outcomes was consistent across the, all the spectrum of EGFR. Empaglipsosin reduced the reporting of acute kidney injury and slowed the progression of the macroalbuminuria overall and across CKD and EGFR categories. And it is well tolerated in patients with or without CKD. So what about the dabaglipsosin in HFPEF? Dabaglipsosin also reduced the combined risk of worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death in patients with or without diabetes mellitus. 
So SGLT2 inhibitors as class 1A indication in patients with mildly reduced LVEF and preserved LVEF. And finally, the patients with the heart failure need cardiac rehabilitation. All patients with the heart failure should be encouraged to fall, enroll in the multidisciplinary care cardiac rehabilitation program. And palliative care is also important because it is a chronic disease, long-standing disease. They might be uh, taking a lot of medication, expensive medication, evidence-based medication, but expensive. So they can be very upset, sometimes depressed. So we need a palliative care for these patients. So we can refer them to the palliative care specialist. It should be considered. And palliative care can provide improved quality of life through symptom management, assistance with the medical decision making, and finally, care that addresses the emotional and spiritual needs. Heart failure, Maria, need to be done. Say, add on it. Say, that we are not going to do it. Long time, long time, long time. So, through now, let people know. So, have your people know. Encourage the people to do it. No, no. Come, let me come. Come, no, come. Let me be a pusher. So, this is my take-home message. So, guideline-directed medical therapy is the mainstay of treatment for initial and chronic management of HFRF. GDMD has been shown to improve the overall survival rates in patients living with HFPEF and four pilots, ANI, beta blocker, mineral leukocorticoid receptor antagonist, SGLT2 inhibitors. Initiation and optimization of medical therapy with proper reassessment for individualized care. Or four pilots look your optimized look your optimized or low light away. Patient outcome will limit you. Patient response will limit you. Patient complication yani ala limit you. Alo role miyau bono. Timely referral for advanced heart failure management. Luelu yabare, kuni bilu yabare, kuni nainari shibare. So finally, the holistic approach. Patient and family education, exercise and rehab program, psychosocial support, and palliative care. Uh, so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. CFM, caring for well-being.